everyone. Thank you for coming to listen to what we have to say. So I'm Harriet Green. I've been the Director of Digital at the British Council since 2010. Uh, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about the British Council, a little bit about our programme, what we've done and how we've done it, uh, which is supported using Agile. And then I'll, I'll cross over to James and he can talk about our work with Indigo Blue, uh, which is aimed at defining the best Agile operating model for us working within the British Council uh, as a, an Agile operation working in a non-Agile uh, uh, organisation. So the British Council... The British Council, uh, many people have heard of the British Council, maybe not everyone can call to mind exactly what it does uh, for the UK. The British Council's main aim is essentially to contribute to a more secure and prosperous world from a UK perspective, thereby benefiting both the UK and the wider world. And the way it does this is to provide valuable, hopefully, opportunities and experiences for people in the UK and worldwide, thereby building trust and positive attitudes towards the UK. It has a royal charter that underpins its objectives, and we call what we do cultural relations. So what, what do we do in the name of cultural relations? There are three essential areas, uh, English, uh, education and society, and exams. We work on the ground in 110 countries. We work with governments, with institutions, and with individuals. And the kind of things we do is we, we teach English face-to-face -face and also providing online resources and uh, learning um, resources. We facilitate tests and exams, mainly in English but in other subjects too. And last year, three million exams were taken with the British Council. The second line you see here is our Education Society line. Uh, mainly works to promote student mobility into the UK and out of the UK and to promote debate around education globally. And the last line, arts, very important to the British Council. We do things like bring artists together from different countries to work together. We mount very large-scale exhibitions around the world. And if you live in London, you may have noticed that Poems on the Underground is run with British Council support. How we funded, this is uh, essentially fairly self-explanatory. And I think the key thing to note and the key thing that the British Council wants to express is that we have the ability to fund the majority of our operation through our, our own revenue. So it, it will probably be obvious from the, even the brief explanation I've given and what the British Council go goals are uh, to uh, foster positive interaction, debate, learning, mutual inspiration, reaching from the UK all over the world. It will be obvious to you all that the British Council and the advent of digital channels could have been made for each other. This could be a match made in heaven. But also, this is an organisation which is multifaceted, complex, far-flung, those 110 operations have quite a degree of autonomy and we have the uh, central organisation with its goals to fulfil and the experience, it, it's a complex organisation so it's obviously not a straightforward thing to take charge of those digital channels and, and exploit them. And actually the organisation did start off pretty well in the early 2000s with some pioneering early initiatives, we trialled online learning, uh, even trialled uh, English teaching via Second Life. Um, new content management systems, so quite pioneering to begin with, but in fact the market wasn't really ready for that, and uh, those early attempts weren't particularly successful. So uh, um, post that, those lack of early successes, there was a bit of a decline in confidence, and I think a, a decline maybe in thinking, well, is, is this really as good as it's, it's, it could, it's made out to be? How, will, how should we use digital best? And there was a long period of lack of investment and lack of direction. Um, so that when I was appointed, along with my co-director, I have a co-director, Myra Hunt, in 2010, the presence was a very mixed picture, picture. None of this is unique to the British Council, but it was pretty serious for an organisation that needs digital channels as badly as the British Council did. Very old CMS, unsupported, not fit for purpose. Reaction to this kind of vacuum at the centre was that lots of enterprising staff around the world set up lots of microsites, very variably managed, huge variety of platforms, local hosting arrangements, and you know, great big tranche of uh, uh, social media sites without necessarily the good understanding of how to make best use of them. So we had high security risk, high brand risk, duplication, massive duplication of cost and effort, and no ability to share or manipulate content because everybody's thing was built on something different. Also, a lack of understanding of the need for user focus, a great tendency to want to tell them what they ought to know rather than listen to what they wanted. Uh, low skill level. Um, alongside this was a profitable face-to-face -face business, but even that needed uh, to replicate, <coughs> replicate its success online 
in order for the business not to fall behind competitors. So we were appointed and we began uh, a programme which was intended to build foundations that would allow the British Council to take any direction it wanted to in the digital space. So what have we done? We've created a new fit-for-purpose design which is responsive with user journeys optimised for our users' tasks and a new visual design. Global content assets that replace the myriad of local content solutions uh, that were in place. Uh, uh, we can support any language or script which is obviously vital for an operation which works globally. Right to left, left to right, any, any language you, you can think of. Digital assets reduced from hundreds and hundreds to a smaller number of hundreds so far. Uh, a proper URL policy, um, harmonised social media channels, uh, and our new content management platform, open source, which we call Solas, which is Gallic for light, and this, this name was achieved via, via an internal competition. Uh, we're trialling and piloting an application layer now, so a global events management tool. Uh, British Council runs hundreds of events, um, pretty manually at the moment, global product catalogue, uh, digital asset management system, um, new analytic approach to analytics, uh, and an agile approach to production and rollout, which allows us to allocate our resources uh, efficiently. And we use the principle of the minimum viable product, which we absolutely love, uh, so that helps us to ensure timely delivery and follow up with enhancements. So this is an old style site on, on the old content management system. This is a Hong Kong site. And this is our New Japan site, and, and Hong Kong will get that treatment um, pretty quickly. So how does, how, why, why Agile? How is Agile helping us? Our current, current programme runs, our business case runs over four years, in fact. It's a, in a context of continual change, both for the British Council and in the digital space. So we need to be responsive. We need not to have locked down our whole programme five years in advance because then we'd, we'd end up irrelevant. So we need to be responsive, and, and Agile allows us to take that incremental and iterative approach. So our programme and our platform need to evolve continually, so it's managed for that reason as a set of products rather than a, a, a project with a, a finite scope. So the process, via the processes that we set up, new feature requests come in continually, and these are prioritised and developed according to business need. This allows us to be far more responsive than we would be if we were working to a static plan, which would almost inevitably become redundant three years after it was created. So one of the principles of Agile is that you start with what you know, you do as much as you can with what you know, and then you iterate based on new knowledge coming in. So our Agile operation and our minimum viable product approach enables us to get new products to market quickly so that then we can measure their impact and performance in the real market and then adapt again as required. So, so we managed to get new products out within, within a matter of weeks. If we look at our latest, for instance, our latest uh, country sites, they are done from start to finish now in five weeks. T the first one took a lot longer. The first one took about nine months, but we had a lot to do as, uh, in, in the set at, the, at the time when we were doing that alongside that to make it happen. So our premise is to iterate and evolve, and Agile enables us to do that. If there is a problem with an approach, we seek to fail early and change our course quickly. And this continuous delivery approach means that every week we are able to release new features to our stakeholders. So it sounds easy, no it isn't. <laughs> very complicated and a very complicated organisation to work with. I've talked about all those countries and those countries having quite a high degree of autonomy and having uh, pretty um, uh, high targets that they have to meet. And we have a layer of the re a regional operation, so all the countries are organised into regions. The regions have their goals and targets. Then we have our specialist business areas, arts, English, and exams, education, society, all with their goals and uh, requirements. And then uh, the digital programme sits alongside other technical programmes which are delivering things like con uh, uh, CRM, common payment services, integration platform. So this is a, a complex matrix to operate within and to uh, achieve our governance and, and reporting within. So familiar cha challenges, I'm sure, uh, to many people here. And I think one of the things that we find is interesting in this uh, connected world is that actually geography is, is a huge and real factor. You know, we are getting to work when people we need to work with are going to bed. So it's, um, it's a real factor in spite of being so connected. And this factor of, of, of digital having to be fitted in alongside 
people that we're work people that we're working with their day job in a sense. This is not really a big shift towards, well, let's create entirely digital roles. People are expected to do it alongside other stuff that they do. There's a good side to that, which means that skills are integrated, but the bad side is they're not necessarily given the time to do it. So some of the things we hear from our stakeholders as, as an agile uh, operation. And my favorite one is, you're the expert, but can I just suggest, because what we tended to experience is that our information architect would go to a country and say, from all I understand about your business, this is the way that your site should be arranged, structured. And that the person would say, well, that's, that's good, really good, but um, hang on a minute. And they would scribble something and say, but how about that? Don't you, don't you think that would be better? Which, you know, it's good to have that um, give and take and that input, but, you know, in the end, digital expertise has to guide. And this is not, you know, or not, not everything is up for deba debate. And this bit about our business is unique. The rest of the business can have the, you know, one size fits all you're proposing. That will be fine for them, but, but we need something different. That, that's a, something that we hear and, and possibly you do too. And our intention to uh, get products to market and then to enhance and iterate is difficult for the organization because, as it says here in red, we waited years for this. We need everything to be right first time because they think we're then going to disappear for another 10 years. In fact, we're not. In fact, we're still there. We're, we're releasing new features to them every week. But it's very hard for people to really believe that when, when they've experienced being kind of rather in the wilderness for, for a, long, a long time. I like it, but our stakeholders won't, won't is another one I really love. And what we hear from our senior management, when exactly will you deliver this? So again, with an agile approach, we need to be able to help uh, senior management to understand that their money is being spent effectively and that benefits are, are understood uh, and that we do have uh, a program uh, and um, time-bound activity. But on the other hand, we are about iteration. We are about improving and improving and improving. And that means we get something, uh, the minimum viable product out first, and then we see how that works. And that can be a hard thing for senior management who have to manage budgets to understand. So um, as we complete our current program, um, on time and on budget, which I love saying, and start to shape our next one, uh, we need to look hard about, at, with the organization about how we agree direction, how we manage our resource against the priorities that change uh, as new opportunities come up, and our, our operating model, our governance model, and our reporting model, and, and that's where we're working with Indigo Blue to try to find the optimum approach to that. So I'll hand over to James. Thank you, Howard. So what's interesting about the British Council and this particular program is that it reflects a lot of what we're seeing generally um, out there in, in the agile marketplace at the moment, um, which is indeed reflected by the, uh, the main topics for this conference. Um, and that is that the problem is not about having a project and how do you deliver it effectively. Uh, the problem is how do you create an environment in which um, that project is connected to the wider organization in an effective way and how do you create a, thing, a, a mechanism, a model whereby work can flow through the system, not just the project you're working on today but an ongoing continuous model where work flows through the system and gets done in the most effective way. Um, where agile delivery is at the heart of that, but it's an enabler to something larger, not the totality in itself. <laughs> You've got the sappy thing. <laughs> so, <clears throat> at the heart of the problem is, as I say, a project, a piece of work, is not an isolated thing. It exists in a context. And the context is the wider organization. Everyone's very aware of that. And for uh, a decade or two, the typical kind of conversation has been, we're doing agile. The rest of the organization needs to understand what we're doing better. You know, they need to change so that we can do things in the optimal way. Now, there's an element of truth in that. There's an element of danger in that as well. The element of danger is that if you're optimizing a localized system, you may not be optimizing the whole system. 
So making your project very, very effective and demanding things of the wider system is not necessarily the best thing for the wider system. Um, but putting that to one side, we want the context to change. What specifically do we want to change about it? Now, this is the third time that I've done a, a keynote here. And two years ago, that was the essence of, of, of my whole talk. Um, and summarizing it very briefly, there are two key things that the wider organization fundamentally needs to understand and think about differently if they're going to reap the rewards of an agile approach at, at the work level. And those two things are they need to think incrementally, so minimum viable product and enhancements or um, some form of incremental delivery. Um, and they need to think about uncertainty differently. It's not all going to be resolved up front. So questions like how much is it uh, going to cost and exactly when it's going to be delivered are interesting questions because they start driving out potentially more uncertainty resolution early on than you really want. Um, it is not 100% essential that the wider organization understand those things perfectly because you can manage when they don't. Which brings me to the second thing, right, governance. So the way to think about governance is it's a structured interface between the project and the wider world. Now, exactly what's in there will depend upon things like how much the wider context understands and, and, and engages with Agile at the project level. But the purpose of it is that the whole thing can be optimized. Now, it's not just about the project being optimized, it's about the whole organization you know, through structured lines of communication. And that was effectively the topic of my talk last year. Um, in the intervening time, we have formalized a governance framework, um, which the sort of various elements of might be interesting. Um, so there's core parts around what's the overall governance structure. So not the team itself, but the, the wider structure. Um, you know, what constitutes a, a valid project plan, uh, a baseline against which you can do um, exception-based reporting, um, and you know, what, what does change management mean in an agile world? These are kind of core fundamental concepts. Um, but things you can add on to that um, uh, as, as uh, extensions are things like commitment management. So if you are being asked to commit to dates and, 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 and costs, then you have to do some additional things that you don't have to do if you're not being asked to. Um, <coughs> there's a whole piece around um, benefits and, and value management, um, which you know, over and above delivering a solution, you've got to deliver value. Um, so how do you structure that? And then we get on to things like, uh, besides a spelling mistake, uh, portfolio management. And when we start getting into multiple projects, then we start getting into the, the next and the main thing of today's talk, which is the operating model. Right, so as I say, the operating model is about the continuous flow of work into the system, and it's fundamentally about how you bring work and people together to create something hopefully magical. So when we start thinking about operating model, we start asking a lot of questions, um, and I thought I'd kind of throw some of them out there. And again, these are, you know, these are the kinds of topics that, that most of the sessions in this conference are going to be about. So one of the first questions over on the right-hand side there is, how do we organize our people to accommodate the work that's flowing through? Um, and we have choices, and there's no right answer. Right? There are options. There are scales where you've got to select the right balance. Um, but the right answer will vary from situation to situation. So for example, um, in a project-based world, we tend to uh, identify a piece of work and then assign the people to the piece of work. Yeah, that's a fairly traditional model. Now, what Agile tells us is that people and interactions are important. Create a team. Why not make that team stable and assign the work to it? Right, so you start getting this kind of team-centric um, way of organizing um, the people, and then you assign the work to it as it flows through. Um, and you know, product-centric team structures is, is a sort of fairly, um, a fairly hot topic at the moment. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, but the thing to say is that the team-centric view is not perfect uh, because uh, the, the challenge you then have is that you have lots of 
potentially lots of different stakeholders. And somehow or other, you've got to kind of cross-manage those stakeholders. So, you know, it solves some problems and it creates new problems. So I'm going to talk about that in a bit more detail. Um, the other big question is funding, the funding model. So again, in the traditional world, you've got this piece of work, big piece of work called a project. Um, one of the critical things about it is that there's a sum of money set aside specifically for that piece of work. Um, so it has a beginning and an end when that money is spent. Um, <coughs> There's you know, obvious problems with that approach, um, but what's the alternative? Right? One of the alternatives is to pre-allocate your money, right? to set a budget. Um, the advantage of that might be you don't have to go through this whole governance process in order to, to um, fund a new piece of work. You know, it's discretion you spend. As an owner, they just have to decide to do it. Fantastic. But then you start getting into questions like, well, who do you give that money to? Who owns the budget, and what's the implications of that? Right. Do you give the money to the product team, the, you know, the delivery team? Right. So there's a team, it's a certain size, it costs a certain amount, those people are going to be there all year, but don't budget. Now the problem with that approach is that the customers who are making use of that team, they don't have any particular vested interest in spending as little as possible and, and optimising what they get for the amount that they spend. They have no ROI interest. They don't gain anything by, by, by achieving a better ROI. So what tends to happen is that the, the, the business customers just go into a mode where, they, where they're negotiating as much of the slice of the pie as they possibly can. That's what they're trying to do. Um, so you go to the other extreme. So lots of organizations then go to the other extreme and they say, right, we'll give all the money <coughs> to the business. Right? So now they've got to spend it sensibly. Now, it's in their interest to spend the money sensibly. So what happens then? Well, what happens then is you have to convince of your business customers for anything that you want to do. Right? So if that's their business functionality, fine. But if it's kind of technical infrastructure stuff that they don't really care about, um, then you've got to go and convince them that that's, that's a good thing to do. So you've kind of just moved the investment problem. Um, the other headline issue is, that they can start making autonomous decisions. Right? <coughs> An extreme autonomous decision is they're not going to go through your central product group, they're going to go and hire someone else to do something, to, you know, to do the same thing in a different way. Because you know, this external agency is cheaper and they've got more control over them. They don't keep sort of saying things like, well, what about our security standards and, and you know, all of those kind of things. So you start getting a diversification. And it doesn't just happen with the extreme things, it happens with even things that are happening on the platform. Um, you know, particularly in a world where people have been used, like in a British Council, people have been used to making autonomous decisions and not being constrained by what other people are doing. Yeah, now suddenly it's platform, it's cross-standardization, it's, it's you know, about controlling them, and they don't want to be controlled. Um, <clears throat> so funding models are quite significant, and that issue of central standardization versus local specialization and, and autonomy. Um, so these are kind of headline operating model considerations. Um, the other ones, uh, you've got to think about the end-to-end -end process. Yeah, so somewhere you have an idea, that's got to turn into something that, that you're going to spend some money on as a discovery phase in the general case before you actually start building things and then there's support and run afterwards and you're looking at the cost of the overall um, <coughs> cost of ownership, not just of build. And that's quite interesting in some cases from an operating model point of view as well, because many organizations, British Council included, have different budgets for build and run. So the people that are interested in keeping the cost of build, build down are not the same people that are interested in keeping the cost of run down, which creates its own problems. Um, <coughs> so that's a bunch of stuff to think about and some considerations. Um, so in the kind of limited amount of time today, I just want to pick on uh, a couple of things to, to drill down into. So the first thing is to start um, thinking about where ideas, where demand comes from, um, and 
Sorry. There's a kind of uh, a, a picture that shows um, the range of different planning horizons that are, you know, each one of those planning horizons is generating work. So it goes from the, you know, the daily stuff that's happening inside a project right the way through to the corporate strategy. Um, and uh, those aren't the only layers, but it kind of is an illustrative set of, set of layers. Now, what's interesting about that is that some of those exist within teams and within projects. They exist within circumstances where the capacity is fixed. So when you're doing your planning, you're kind of dealing with a fixed capacity, and you're trying to feed work in that uses it in the most effective way. Right? And that's one kind of problem, and that's a very standard, agile type of problem. But there comes a point at which you move beyond that boundary, right, where you're looking at, this is the work that we want to do. How do we flex the capacity? You know, what, if there's a return on investment, if it's cost justifiable, then it's cost justifiable whether we have the team and the people in place to do it at the moment or, or not. Um, so that's you know, an organization from an operating model point of view needs to start looking at uh, the flexibility of resources and therefore questions like should it be in-house or out, out, um, outsourced or some combination um, and if it's outsourced then how do you, you know, what's the procurement look like and all of these kind of issues. So I said I'd come back to the question of um, organizing work and organizing teams and the implications of the different models. So I want to start off with a simple model. Right? So everyone will be very familiar with this who runs agile projects. You have a set of stakeholders. You have one product backlog, you have one team, and they're working on a product or product, a set of products. Yeah? It's a nice, simple model, straightforward. So those stakeholders between them decide what work to do, they prioritize things, they put it on a single backlog, a single queue of work. And the team, which is a fixed capacity, works through that. Yeah, nice and easy, no problems at all. So the questions start arising when you start thinking about what happens when you take that set of stakeholders and, and, and have lots of them, lots of different separate groups of stakeholders, um, and potentially the set of products, there can be lots of them, set of teams, there can be lots of them. Right, now, one of the standard answers for dealing with lots of stakeholders is force them to get together and become one. Yeah, so we're only going to have one product backlog. It is your job as a set of stakeholders to get together and collectively decide your priorities. Yeah, now, that's a great answer. Yeah, and in some organizations, in some situations, it can work and it's definitely worth going for. Um, but it doesn't always work, so you've got to have other answers as well. So here we have a product-centric model. Right? It's a multiplicity of the same thing. Yep, fantastic. And the key thing is that for each product, you've got a single set of stakeholders that you have to deal with. Yep. So in that world, a product-centric approach is absolutely fine. Um, the challenge with that model comes if you have projects that span multiple products. You know, so you need to do a piece of work where um, <coughs> somehow or other you're going to have to update all of these. You know, what do you do? Um, <coughs> so do you take that piece of work and break it up between all the various teams? You know, that doesn't sound very agile. You're delivering pieces of work which are not complete. It's not a proper incremental plan. Uh, <clears throat> and also, you've got a, uh, an issue in that if you're the project manager of that product, you've got to prioritize your work relative to all the other work that's going on. And how do you do that? Um, so one way of doing that is, as a project manager, you have to go and negotiate with all the product owners of the various products. Yeah because ultimately it's their decision as to what, you know, who works on what, when, and what the relative priorities of things are. <clears throat> now, that's very, very inefficient. So a better alternative, so this is the general picture, a better alternative is to stop thinking in terms of teams and start thinking in terms of capacity. Right? That capacity could be part of one team. You could have one team and, and several, layer, you know, several buckets of capacity so it's just a number of points. Um, and that number of points has a backlog. So now in the situation I was talking about before, 
you've got a normal product owner of the product who has their product backlog, their priorities, and their assigned capacity. And then you have a project manager right, who has their team, or they might reuse parts of the same team, but they have their capacity, which they're in control of. They don't have to negotiate with anyone to make use of that capacity. Yeah, you've still got the, the same team, you've still got all the communication and, and all the good things going on, but the capacity is divided between multiple product backlogs, um, and each backlog has their own set of stakeholders that combine together to agree their priorities. Um, <coughs> and that switch from thinking about teams to thinking about capacities is a fundamental shift in, in simplifying the whole problem. That, you know, that's our general experience in going out and talking to people. So you know, I'd like to flag that one. Um, so in the general model, yeah, we can have multiple stakeholders that contribute together to the same backlog. Uh, we can have, uh, that's wrong actually, we can't have that. <laughs> right? Each capacity by definition has its own backlog. That's, that's the essence of the approach. Um, and then, you know, whether or not each capacity is only allowed to work on one, one product, specialist knowledge, or whether or not uh, <coughs> they're allowed to work on multiple products, and, and what they do is, you know, they have the, the, the continuous engagement with the stakeholders and the business problem and that kind of understanding. That's sort of fluid and flexible and needs to be decided as you go along. Um, there's a special case of this, which is directly relevant to... Uh, the British Council, which is what you do when you've got a platform. Because a platform is a product um, and it needs a capacity to maintain. You know, fundamentally, a platform has to be maintained, has to be continuously improved. And what you have is a set of you know, local stakeholders and in the British Council scenario, that's quite a complex group because they've already got a matrix structure of, of uh, different countries and regions against different, you know, the English and the arts and, and so on. So the actual stakeholder community itself is already complicated before you add on, on the IT delivery element. Um, <coughs> so they have local autonomy over their local product, which is based on the capabilities of the platform. Um, if they start wandering off and becoming too specialised in terms of the way that they're doing things, you start losing the economies of scale of having a, a platform and, and, you know, and the, the controls that stop people going off-brand and breaking security constraints and so on. Um, <clears throat> but if you have this capacity for the platform, and it has its product backlog, where do those requirements come from? And where does the budget come from? That is the absolute headline question. Um, and it's being worked through at the moment because it's quite a complicated question to answer. Um, because, you know, in one sense, the answer is these people here. They're the ultimate stakeholders. That, that's where value is derived from. Um, but they don't necessarily have the collective vision to make good decisions for something that's shared. So if, they're, you know, if they can't make good decisions, then who can? Um, so in the long term, after the original platform is built and so on, then, you know, then, then there's... there's, there's you know, definite roles for shared ongoing product development. Uh, you know, and what's interesting is that the, the, you know, the senior management team, their starting viewpoint is that once you've built the platform, you get rid of that <laughs> and you just move into, um, yeah, there's going to be some demand from your end stakeholders, isn't there? You know, just do it when it comes along. Um, so... I just wanted to finish off then with um, just a summary diagram uh, for reference later, really. Which uh, So this is the, the helicopter view of the overall operating model and the things that are being considered in it um, for the British Council. Um, as I say, just a high-level view, just something to refer back to later. And that was everything I wanted to say today. Thank you. Hello. Uh, have you segmented your st stakeholders and what are you doing or thinking about digital obsolescence? In, in terms of uh, cementing our stakeholders, 
what we've done is, is appoint uh, a new role to the, in the British Council, a head of digital in each uh, region. Some regions where the market is very different, we've got two or three, and a head of digital in each specialist business unit, and again, where it's complex, two or three. And they now form our kind of requirements panel and our conduit for requirements to come in to us from, so they're representing their part of the business. And that works <coughs> quite well. That's a kind of a monthly requirements meeting where we say, well, anything that needs to come in, any requests from the business, come in through this route. And that's, you know, that's, that's, a, a, that's a good um, uh, <coughs> attempt, in a sense, to get that kind of uh, coalescing of stakeholders. Uh, and it works quite well. If you look at our backlog, um, probably about half the things on our backlog come from that stakeholder group because there are other things that you know, come from just things that we said we do any, anyway, things that come in when the CEO wants a new product, you know, you tend to put that in the backlog. So it's, it works to some extent, and I think that's, you know, I, I, I think you're never going to reach a system, you know, a perfect system where, you know, that you've got one solution and, and it works. And if you've got it for, you know, it's only going to last a week and then something else, you know, something else will come along. But I think if you try to, if you continually kind of try to make it the ideal situation, uh, then, you know, you're not going to reach that. But, but you, I think, con continual striving to get the best, the best that you can do this week, today. So that, that's kind of what we do on that. Um, obsolescence, that's, that's an interesting one. I think um, uh, we tend to look not too far ahead. In fact, I think uh, I don't know if it was up on that. If I kept it in, but you know, the, the organisation has said to us, "Can you plan till 2020?" And we said, "No, we can't do that because if I sat here and said I knew what was going to happen in 2020, I would just be, you know, by my book, but I'd be wrong." So uh, we tend to look uh, five years ahead, and we tend again to be doing. And I think it's the best I, for me. It's the best <coughs> approach. We're doing the best thing we can with the knowledge that we have today. So that's 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 how I would answer that. Um, just to add to that, I think um, in the general case, segmentation is possible. You want to merge <laughs> as much as possible, but, but each segment has its own capacity. Um, and besides seg segmenting uh, in verticals, you can also segment in other ways. So uh, you can have, for example, um, countries that have been rolled out to, and they are going to have a level of demand. Um, they're also going to be waiting for some new stuff, which is roadmap stuff. So you can start segmenting between uh, support and ongoing enhancement versus major deliverables. So it's the same team. Um, it might be quite a large team, and it itself might be structured in various ways. But broadly speaking, you start, you, know, you allocate a, a budget or a capacity to, um, to enhancement work to ensure that there's a continuous flow of, of business as usual type activity versus the, the big ticket items that are also happening at the same time. So capacity versus um, is directly linked to segment. So the question is not if you, but, but the whole challenge is how you, what, you know, what segments you're actually going to, to go for at the end of the day. Okay. There we go. Um, does your, your, you talked about capacity, does that also represent the delivery teams? Because um, I work in an environment where you, we, we ha almost have a pool of resources from different technical areas, yep. and for each project they get pull, pulled together into a team to deliver that project, and then the project's delivered, and then that's the, 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 the kind of d disbanded again. And that one of the effects of that is that uh, the teams ever g only ever go through the forming and norming process, never get to the performing and storming. So, is, is that how is that is that how things work? How do you avoid that? Um, you ultimately don't avoid it. Um, you're always going to have a mixture of the two. The degree to which you can have fixed long-term teams depends upon variables such as. Um, such as the different range of skills that you've got, I and mean, how many different, um, you know, can you create teams that make sense given the number of different skills that you have to have and that the, the volume of work that's flowing through. Um, but, um, so in the general case, I still think you, you need to have the ability to create project teams 
um, but that shouldn't be the that shouldn't be the default position. Um, so, you know, for at least you know, there's a whole bunch of stuff which is at least business as usual, ongoing support, lots of small stuff that's flowing through, um, and you know, th those ought to be um, long-running teams. Sorry. Thank you. It's a supplementary to that question, really. I was wondering if you could say a bit about how you are measuring that capacity. Is, is it simply headcount or skills mix, or are you using um, any kind of output measure, function points or anything like that to measure that capacity? Uh, right. the, the, key, the key driver, I mean, the, the key number that you put against capacity is, is, is number of points. And obviously, number of points is, is a little bit, you know, it's not as clinical as function points, although function points aren't that precise either. Um, there are higher level questions to address and if, you, if, you're, if you're comparing different uh, resource models. So if you want to compare in-house with external you know, outsourcing, external agency or whatever, then someone is looking for some, you know, there's got to be some uh, relative measure of of which is more effective, which is quite a hard thing to do. Um, you're trying to do it in a couple of places at the moment. Um, you know, the starting point is to try and do it on points as, as a measure of the amount of, you know, of, of productivity um, and being quite careful about making them similar sized things, which is the point of points. Um, so that's the starting point. Um, it's not perfect. Um, but I get, you know, but, but nothing is. <laughs>